We rarely get a chance at this man on the West Coast. Uh, he seems to enjoy that big city of New York and doesn't seem to leave too often. He is one of America's great literary lions. As I said, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner for Armies of the Night and the Executioner's Song. This is his uh, latest work. It's a whimsical but incisive look at Marilyn Monroe and other powerful women called Of Women and Their Elegance. Ladies and gentlemen, would you greet Mr. Norman Mailer. You've never lost that walk, that body language of the ex-fighter. I mean, you might not be an ex-fighter. You might still be punching people out for all I know. But Well, I think it, I probably have that walk because I was never a fighter. You, you, you know, it's, fighters try to get rid of that walk. You know, an ex-fighter doesn't want people to say, oh, look at him, that poor fellow, he's an ex-fighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Writers don't mind it. They say, yeah. oh, oh, they think I'm a fighter, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, you do intimidate people merely by your presence, Norman. I know I'm not aware of it. If, if you knew how small the soul was that beats within my fat heart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. There's no fear in that body at all, is there? No fear. <laughs> do you have any fears, Norman? Oh, do you sure. ever wake up in the middle of the night and go, mm. No, not in years. No, not in years. No. That's what's good about middle age. Yeah. Uh, this thick blanket comes over your terrors. That, uh, You're you talking about fat? N <laughs> spiritual fat. Yeah. Spiritual fat. Spiritual fat. A shield. A shield. It, you know, it depends. On, it depends on, on, on the person we're talking about. Some people cover themselves with spiritual fat. Others get a shield. Um, yeah. I mean, you have everything from a slob to a stoic. You, yeah. You, you know, but... But this is a whole brick wall. I remember when I was young, I always used to think, ah, oh, middle-aged people. Well, you know, and then you, after a while, believe it or not, you're middle-aged. And uh, so you have to say, have something to console yourself with. So you say, well, at least I don't have all those youthful terrors any longer. <laughs> yeah, that is nice to hit middle age. I'll be there soon. <laughs> I'll be there to greet you when you come over. <laughs> Two silver foxes sitting here. We're senatorial, you know. Really, every year you get to look more and more senatorial. Yeah. And I hope you'll say the same thing to me. Yeah, but you, ha you have, I may look at, but you have run. Oh, for mayor. For office. I don't, I don't look mayoral anymore. But mayor of the number one city I mean, in the world, and you were re rejected in your city. Yes, I know, but I made a fundamental error. I didn't realize that a guy with curly hair shouldn't run for mayor in New York. Yeah. I lost my curly hair, you, you know, it turned straight. And then look at the, look at the guy as we come to the mayor. He's got no hair at all. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, in your campaign speeches, you said too much. You were too attackable because you were outspoken and truthful. They never attacked me. Uh, I, I, wanna, I, I thought that when I got into it, uh, you know, I'd be in the thick of it and, and it'd be a huge fight and then I'd, and I'd be good at that and I could use my wits, you know, and I'd rise. Yeah. People, more and more people would notice me because I'd handle myself well, but what happens, they paid no attention to me. Uh, that's what happens to all outside candidates. You know, I kept waiting for me, Desposito, to pick up the phone and call me and say, hey, Mayor, get your nose clean. I want to make a deal with you, you know? Yeah, he yeah. never called. No. <laughs> and, and your yeah. running mate was Jimmy Breslin. Yeah. He made an immortal remark on election night. What did he say? He turned to our, our, our followers, you know, who were all drinking and celebrating our loss with us. Yeah. And he said, I want to apologize for having been part of a process which closed the bars of New York for a day. <laughs> did you say that? Yeah. It might have been very well that the mayor's mansion, had you been elected, might have been some saloon. And, uh, in New York, huh? You know, if Breslin had come to visit it, it would have taken care of its share of the uh, output of natural spirits in this country in a year, yeah. Yeah. With your books over the years, I've been through hell with you, Norman. To hell and back. To hell and back. Right, to hell and back. Um, I was with you through those turbulent 60s when you were on the attack and uh, you led a rebellion in this country. And now it seems as though you're laid back. I, I don't know, are there no movements, causes that appeal to you now? Or have you learned a lesson and have chosen to stay back a bit? I mean, there are, there are women's causes now. There are nuclear problems. There are the problems of the ecology of the minorities. But you don't uh, seem to jump in. Well, I, th I think we all have those eras when the large problems are temperamentally closer to us than other, other decades. 
But I think, you know, I don't know anyone who's willing to die for an idea any longer. I don't know any ideas that are worth dying for any longer. It seems to me that, you know, that to be truly serious about ideas, you have to be prepared to die for your ideas. Right. I don't mean literally die for them. I mean consider the possibility that eventually you might have to. If the you were prepared. Were... You led the attack on the Pentagon, I remember. Well, I would say I led it. I was one of, you know, 40 or 50 people, let's say, who were nominally the leaders of it. Actually, it was a leaderless movement. And there were 50,000 people who did march down to the Pentagon. But yes, at that point, one was willing to go for, to jail for that idea. Yeah. You know, and, and of course, we were all pretty paranoid at that time, and uh, we thought we might well go to jail. And you face it, and you say, yeah, all right, I'll go to jail. I do believe in this idea. I don't know anyone who's in a hurry to go to jail today for an idea. Yeah. Do you find any reason to go to a, to a war these days? No, it's it's uh, the wars seem a mockery. Uh, it's all, but I have a feeling we're going to come around a bend, and there'll be new ideas. And uh, uh, the 80s may be very exciting yet. I have that feeling. Because you think so? Yeah, I think it'll be an exciting decade. Because the 70s were so boring. Boring. Oh. boring. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Almost like the 50s. Uh, yeah. yeah. The only thing exciting was the music of the 50s. You know, it's yeah, got a little yeah, beat 50s, going. Yeah, and fine. The mu music was good. And jumping yeah. around. And Even the music in the 70s. I don't know much about music, but it seemed to me it wasn't as good as it's been in previous decades, but I mean, I can, uh, that's not my subject. Can I mean, women they, write with the same guts that men can? Uh, I, think, I think they write with other uh, strengths. You know, I don't know what guts is in writing. You know, I thought I used to know years ago, but uh, you know, the most delicate, gentle book can be more of a work of guts than uh, something very uh, macho. Uh, Virginia Woolf was, was probably a very gutsy writer uh, because it, she probably came close to committing suicide every time she got deep into writing a book. And uh, so, you know, that's what I mean by I, I truly don't know what guts are in writing any longer. It, mm. I think when you're young, you do face that problem much more because you have the feeling, you know, young writers feel they're going to write a book and, and uh, when it comes out, the authorities are going to come to the door and knock on it and drag them off and beat them up and imprison them and kill them. Yeah. Because yeah. the things they're saying are so dangerous and terrible. And then you learn, and it's half reassuring and half depressing, that a book comes out and it doesn't change the world much at all. And if it does change the world, it changes it in little ways over the years. And 10 years later, someone comes up to you and says, I liked your book about such and such very much. Yeah. And it, it was important for me. And they tell you why. And slowly you begin to realize that being a writer does have its effect, but it's not a dramatic effect. It stirs. And so as you get older, you realize that uh, it takes less guts, particularly in a country like this where, uh, y you know, uh, whatever America's faults, and they are uh, manifold, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, you can write here in a way you could never write in many other countries, yeah. including a few big ones we could name. Have you ever lived under a, a country dominated by uh, communism? No. no. Have you ever visited there? Never visited there. I don't want to. I don't desire to. But the point is, it's one thing to live in a... Uh, historically, it, it, how have nations dealt with each other? Historically? What do you to mean? Through the beginning of time. From strength? Well, we, you, can't, you can't go by that. Uh, that, that you, know, you know, we live in a different situation in this... This period of history is different from any other period before because of the prevalence of communications and the sophistication of techniques. And all I'll go back to saying something very simple. It's my belief that the Russians, and I don't like them at all, but it's my belief that the Russians would never dare to take us over. Because if they took us over, we would destroy them. Their mentality simply couldn't sit on top of our mentality. It would be too volcanic for them. And so I think they would give us a wide berth. It, the, the safety of communism, the health of communism, is to have confrontation all the time, is to be in a showdown with us. The, the, their strength comes from the fact they have a huge enemy, us. Mm -hmm. And so they keep everyone in line over in Russia. If they didn't have a huge enemy, what would they do? They have to face their people and say, here are the dull products we make for you. Here are the repressive measures we lay upon you. Uh, here are the stupidities we try to put into your head. Uh, we, uh, we save them by being their opponent, their enemy. 